All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Honor Street of Chemistry. Today we are taking a look at our electrons. We're going to continue fleshing out this idea of the electrons, how we can continue to observe it and interact with our electrons as we look at the electrons around our atom. And we're going to get to know a little bit more about this energy that they give off as well. So kind of layering the last two pieces in together as we talk about our electrons in particular, these movers and the shakers. So let's start by talking a little bit about this guy called Werner Heisenberg. And I know... Heisenberg, big resurgence. Thank you, Breaking Bad. Heisenberg. So what Werner Heisenberg was actually about was kind of looking at this quantum level, this idea, and we saw this in the video, this idea that electrons can be both particles and they can be waves, and it's not until you actually measure them that they become one or the other. And so what Werner Heisenberg said that was that if you were looking at electrons, you're going to have this thing we call an uncertainty principle, that no experiment can measure both the position and the momentum or the speed of a quantum particle simultaneously at the same time. Right? Well, let's think about this. If you were going to take, and you want to know the second your car passed the 435 line heading into Kansas, the second you pass into Kansas, so what are we going to do? We're going to set up a high-speed camera right on that boundary line, that, that border line, so we know exactly where our car is going to pass, and we'll know exactly where that car is at that precise moment. So we're driving along, we're driving along, we snap a picture, and it looks, we know exactly where the car is, we know exactly the location, but we have no idea now how fast that car was moving. Okay? The, moment, the momentum has been removed. So no experiment can measure both the position and the momentum of a quantum particle of, or of an electron at the same time. We call this the Werner-Heisenberg uncertainty principle. The Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. You can't, you can't know both. You just can't. And I love this little comic here, this, this particular railroad is governed by the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle. We cannot tell you the location and the speed of a train at, at the same time. We can tell you how fast it's going, but not where it is. Or we can tell you where it is, but not how fast it's going. I just, I find it humorous because <laughs> it'd be a one lousy ra railroad company. Okay, cool. Now the second person we can talk about, we've got all of our models. We've been building these models in, building these models in. Our most recent has been the Bohr. But we know, we know that electrons are not just particles. They are waves as well. And it's, again, the act of measuring collapses the wave functions and lets us say, is it a wave or is it a particle? So we have a new model. And it came around by these guys by the name of Schrodinger and de Broglin. We've talked a little bit about Schrodinger and Schrodinger's cat and kind of his analogy of explaining this wave-particle duality. And they came up with this new model. And their new model was that they act like waves in what we call the wave mechanical model. And I know this, this picture is a little, little funky. Really, they said is there's this kind of area around the nucleus, and we don't have our nucleus running, the nucleus right here in the center, but there's this area around the nucleus where the electrons kind of like to hang out. This area where we've got the highest probability, the highest percentage possibility of actually finding the electrons. And this is the, the area they like to spend most of their time. I propose this idea, the wave mechanical model, and we, we sometimes give it a slightly different name. Now, remember, if I'm going too fast, feel free to pause, rewind, review as many times as you'd like. Right. Schrodinger de Broglie, now this idea, we're going to put these electrons in this kind of cloud or this energy wave, this wave area around our nucleus. And we sometimes call it the electron cloud model. Electron cloud model being that there's this tiny nucleus surrounded by a cloud of electrons, this place where we most likely, or with 99.95% certainty, can find this area or the location of our electrons. Now the nucleus is still just about all of the mass. 99.95 percent, excuse me, that's excuse me, that's percent of the nucleus mass. Most, most all of the mass of our atoms from the nucleus. Just a teeny tiny bit from the electrons. But so for the most part everything's the same. Still have our nucleus. Our chemical properties are, are actually still going to be based on the arrangement of the electrons. There are movers and our shakers. They're the partiers. They like to go out, meet up with other people, make some bonds. Uh, uh. But most of our atom, our understanding is the same from our previous models. We've just added this idea that instead of a set orbital, we've got this cloud, this kind of area around the nucleus where these electrons like to hang out. Sometimes called the wave mechanical model, sometimes called the electron cloud model, sometimes call it the quantum mechanical model. They all mean the same thing. So I, here's, here's an image, and I know it's kind of funny, but this is... This is this area where we got electrons, they're moving around, and this in this cloud we'd actually find only two electrons. 
in this cloud here. There's only two electrons in this space. So we're saying if we had a bunch of pictures and we could see where these electrons kind of are residing, it's in this energy cloud, somewhere in this electron cloud. Right? Well, and now to unveil our latest model is you. Right? And we know we start with Democritus, Tomos, Adams, Dalton, Billiard Ball, Thompson, Plum Pudding model, the Rutherford model, nuclear with this one ring of electrons, the Bohr model with these set energy levels, and now we've got this quantum mechanical or this electron cloud model. But there might be more. Remember, we're not quite sure why an electron sometimes acts like a particle and sometimes acts like a wave. There's more to be discovered. And as we continue to learn more, we will continue to build on this model. But this is our current understanding, that our electrons reside in these kind of energy or electron clouds. And that's where we can go to find our address, which we're going to talk about actually coming back a little bit later. Okay? Now, we know electrons can give off light. And we, we know that all light is made up of all these waves coming at us at the same speed, speed of light, 3.00 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. And we actually use this to identify our elements. We saw this with the flame lab. Different number of electrons, different orientation. They jump and fall and jump and fall. And because they jump to different heights and fall to different heights, they give off different wavelengths, different energies of light. Well, it turns out we can use this not only in our flame lab, flame test lab, we can use this to actually identify it just like a fingerprint. And we call it an emission spectrum or an emission spectra. So what we'll do is we'll take a tube full of some gas, some electron, some, excuse me, some atoms, and we'll send some energy through it. In this case, electricity. That energy causes the electrons to jump and fall and jump and fall and jump and fall at very specific heights. And that produces some light. That light we can then send through a tiny slit, shoot through a prism, and get all those bands split out on a spectra. So it's kind of like if we could take this, this black bar here and we swing it up, and now we can see, okay, there's a band of red light in there, there's a band of green light, band of blue light, and a band of violet. And you'll notice red is bending the least. Longest waves bends the least. Violet waves, shortest wavelengths, we can bend those the most. So we see that they have bent the most as they pass through that prism. Now, if we just took white light, regular old white light, we would get what's called a continuous spectrum. And that's this first one here. Notice it's got all the colors of the wind, a rainbow. And all the colors of the rainbow. But different elements, because they have different arrangements of electrons, will get very specific bands at very specific wavelengths. And we, it's a fingerprint, an elemental fingerprint of what electron configurations or what electrons are getting excited and what energies are being emitted. And so there's actually three different ways we can interact with the spectrum. One of the ways is what's called a continuous spectrum. If you take white light, shine it through a prism, you get all the colors. It's called a continuous spectrum. Now, if we took some sample, some gas sample, and just one element, and we heat it up, electrons get excited and fall, and excited and fall, and excited and fall, and give that energy back off as light, we split that in our prism, we see an emission spectrum. We are emitting light from our sample to create an emission spectrum. Okay? Those are the wavelengths of energy being given off by this these excited electrons in our hot gas. Now there's one more type of emission spectrum, and that's our excuse me, not emission spectrum, but third type of spectrum, and that's our absorption spectrum. If we take regular old white light, shoot it through the same gas that's been cooled, and then break it apart in the prism, see what we're we're seeing the leftover light coming through the cold gas, leftover light passes through our prism, splits apart, and we notice there's bands missing. Well, where'd that energy go? Well, it was absorbed by the gas. And what we're seeing are all the other wavelengths that weren't absorbed. Well, and you'll notice, for this, if this is the same gas, both hot and cold, and if we take the two spectrum and we were to superimpose them, what would you get? Well, you'd get the continuous spectrum. You'd get regular white light, all of the light put together. Now, you picked up a lab on your way in here today. For that lab, uh, take a look, um, figure out on that lab as you look at it, as you look at that lab, we're actually going to work the calculations in the front, and then I want you to read the back. We're not going to quite be in the lab today or tomorrow. We're going to actually come back and explore that a little bit later. But it, today we are going to have a little bit of a virtual lab so that you can kind of see this the spectrum idea in motion, see this as it starts to play out and all fit together. So now that you've kind of got a background as to what we're talking about, Go ahead, hop on over to our Blackboard page and hit our next item on our agenda. Awesome. Thanks, guys.